in CAMS working in Exeter. And I'm going to take you through the first of two tutorials, and I have the difficulty of going through a huge topic in a short space of time, but it'll be approximately two 15 minute sessions, which I hope you enjoy. I've called this a developmental approach to child and adolescent mental health. The learning outcomes as supplied by the university include you being more aware of how common mental health problems are in children and young people, sometimes referred to as CYP. They want you to come away with some knowledge about common mental health conditions in children, their causes, management and when they tend to manifest and understand a bit about CAMS and including the legal frameworks we use in treating under 18s. There is an absolute wealth of resource out on the internet with regards to psychiatry and in particular CAMS. I would point everyone in the direction of medschoolpsychiatry.com which has lots of study materials that you can use for free including how to take histories um, and lots of subject material there. In particular to CAMS there is the IACAPAP, the International Association for Child and Adolescent Psychiatrists, and they have a free to access MOOC, massive open online course, where there are videos about child psychiatry, about the developing brain, and you can get uh, quizzes and you can get a signature a certificate to say that you have completed their exercises. So that's highly recommended. There is also freely available a textbook all about CAMS. This is uh, this is a large volume, but if you're interested in a particular subsection of child and adolescent psychiatry, it's well worth a read and you can download it through this link I'm sharing here. Part one is an introduction to this topic. The prevalence of mental health conditions in children and young people is startling and it's increasingly reported to be growing. At least one in eight children and young people will meet diagnosis for a mental health condition. And the split in younger kids, girls versus boys, is about even. But towards middle of adolescence, and adolescence goes up to about 25 now we understand, a quarter, 25% of young women will meet criteria for a mental illness, which is double that of, of young men. And half of those, in particular the girls, will have self-harmed or attempted to take their own life, which is a fairly shocking statistic. Emotional disorders, particularly anxiety and depression, are on the increase and there's lots of debate as to why that might be, including whether we're just getting better at recognising and making these diagnoses. Of particular interest, we should consider looked after children, that's children in, in foster care or those who've been adopted, um, taken into care by the state, who are four times more likely to experience mental health conditions than their peers. At the same time, we must recognise that the demand for services uh, has gone through the roof really in the last five to ten years. And to give some sense of that, you don't need to know these statistics, but 19,000 young people were admitted to hospital after self-harm just in the year of 2015, and that was a 14% rise, and it has gone up since then. And referral rates to CAMS have increased exponentially and much faster than the workforce has grown. So this has put a, a big burden on the CAMS services and is one of the reasons why we can't possibly see everyone referred to us. Sadly, uh, a small proportion of spending on mental health goes towards CAMS services and lots of people like myself would argue that that's rather perverse and the wrong way around. The life of a child psychiatrist is very interesting um, in terms of what we come across in our career. And I won't go through all of these, but these are examples of cases across the age range uh, that I might see in a given year. And I have seen these particular cases um, all the way from, from young people with behavioural difficulties or uh, neuropsychiatric problems like tics and Tourette's, those who have uh, difficulties attending school, who might be struggling with their learning, uh, to young people who might have gender identity issues, um, abnormal behaviours as a result of physical health problems, uh, all the way through to the more recognised mental illnesses, depression, anxiety, and usually in later adolescence, uh, psychotic disorders. 
So what are the current issues affecting young people? Well, if you look at the headlines, things look quite grim. On the left here is a um, news article, which is a few years old now, that suggests the young people feel they have nothing to live for. And on the right is a very up to date piece uh, just from three days ago from this recording, uh, stating that a fear of failure is giving UK children the lowest happiness levels in Europe. And I think we mustn't despair completely. We don't have a generation of young people who are all beset with mental illness, but something is going on in the cultural zeitgeist uh, such that young people do feel more desperate. I think they feel more uncertain about their job prospects, their employment, about wider issues like uh, politics and the natural world with global warming and so on. So times are more uncertain for young people and COVID has only um, only actually increase that, I would argue. But these aren't actually new problems. So this is a very old quote, uh, which demonstrates really that adolescence has always been a difficult time for young people. Um, and this refers to the behaviours of young people and how they might be seen as irresponsible or difficult by those elder than them. And this was actually said by Socrates in the fifth century BC. So what we learn is that childhood is a time of development and it can be distressing for the young person in gaining independence and identity. It can be challenging in terms of separation from parents and individuation, that is becoming an adult in one's own right. Uh, but it's not all bad and it's not all the media would have us believe. So early intervention and prevention is really the cornerstone of what we think about in child and adolescent mental health services. Half of all long term mental health issues uh, in which you might have in mind the adults in their 30s with schizophrenia that you've met on the inpatient unit um, or the elderly person with bipolar affective disorder you met in a GP surgery, half of those issues are detectable at the age of 14. So this is where the difficulties begin and 75% of them by the age of 18. So this is the argument for early intervention and prevention. And I also find that children and young people are, are fascinating. And the nice thing about working with them is there's a huge potential for change. And that's because they have plastic developing brains. This is a quite a famous slide now from a few years ago that shows the various areas of the brain maturing in terms of neuroplasticity and actually our current understanding is that the frontal lobe which is where uh, personality and emotionality and uh, logic and reasoning sits isn't fully formed until the age of 25. So for those of you still in your early 20s I can tell you you are still adolescents and your brains are still growing and maturing. Something very important to think about is the effect of adverse childhood experiences and there's a huge amount of evidence now that these really are the trigger points for lots of mental illness. So in addition to risk factors which might be genetic, these are the environmental causes of mental illness as recognised in huge studies now. So these are the 10 key adverse childhood experiences that are shown statistically to be risk factors for mental illness and if you score four or more out of 10, that makes you three times more likely to suffer depression in later life. It also makes you much more likely to get cancer and have a heart attack and develop autoimmune illnesses. So bizarrely, what we understand better than we ever did before is that early life adversity can put people at risk of severe physical health problems. And this is why people with severe mental illness will die 15 to 20 years earlier than those without those illnesses. So when you're taking histories in um, not only child psychiatry, but um, adult mental health, think about these adverse childhood experiences. And this is the importance of what is called a developmental history. In CAMS, we work in a very broad multidisciplinary group and psychiatrists are just one part of a broad functioning team. I, in liaison psychiatry, work extremely closely with paediatricians and paediatric nurses. Um, the psychiatrist's role in amongst this is around diagnosis or what we would call formulation, understanding the biopsychosocial model of a young person's presentation. And yes, we will prescribe, but probably not in more than 50% uh, of cases, perhaps. And we also are the people who will be most involved in managing 
high risk cases. So we must consider the child uh, in the centre of the world around them. And we must think when a child presents to us in CAMS, not only what is the problem with the young person, um, but what has happened to this young person and what is going on around this young person, because no child exists in isolation. So a good history involves understanding what's going on in the family system, particularly with regards uh, parenting, which might be neglectful or overly att attentive, attentive and intrusive. What's going in their school on, in their school system and their education? Are they struggling in school? Are they being bullied, uh, ostracised, for example? And also, what's going on in their wider community? So, um, are they in an area of deprivation where there aren't sufficient resources to help support this young person to thrive? And might those be the causes that they're presenting with low mood or anxiety? So this is a helpful slide to demonstrate the biopsychosocial model, which I'm sure you've heard of before in a bit more detail. The biological things uh, are both within the child over here, their genetics and their brain development, um, and also more broadly within their family. And we think about what mental illnesses run within families is very significant. The psychological considerations in green here, again, aren't just simply what is in their child, but also in the attachment between child and parent or caregiver and things such as loss and um, separation. And there are many social factors that we have touched on already. We don't have a chance or enough time to talk about what attachment is, but at child psychiatrists will be very interested in plotting out uh, family history extensively and learning not only about what has happened in terms of mental illness in this particular example, there's several um, suicides here recorded, um, but also the relationship between child and parent and whether that has been good enough and containing enough to result in normal development. So I've mentioned formulation, and this is what we mean by the complete understanding of why a young person is presenting as they are, what have been the four P's involved in their presentation. So that is to say, what is the predisposing factors that have lent towards this problem? What are the precipitating factors? So what has happened in recent times, uh, like death of a grandparent or a physical or sexual assault that have been problematic for them? But also what are the perpetuating factors, so what continues to happen that is preventing them from getting better, and also what are the protective factors? So do they have a good working relationship with their main teacher in school? Are they close with a sibling uh, or with somebody else in a professional capacity who is helping to preserve their resilience? So formulation is the integrative conceptualization of a problem, including understanding what the prognosis is. That's the end of part one and in part two we will be considering some of the presenting problems that come to camps.